Okay, so we've got Pat Peliquin from Houston, Texas, and you're going to be doing um, filling the emotional tanks, right? Correct. Okay, well, whenever you are ready, we are ready too. All right. Hi, guys. My name is Pat Peliquin. I'm a teacher and coach at Lamar Consolidated Independent School District. I teach and coach at Lamar Consolidated High School. This is my 24th year. Uh, I attended McNeese State University in Lake Charles, Louisiana. I've got my master's uh, from McNeese as well. Uh, while at McNeese, I was uh, involved in the intramural program uh, at McNeese for college students. Uh, at high school level, I've coached tennis, football, basketball, softball, volleyball. Okay. And, and I have three kids. We are ready. We are ready to. Uh, I am married Hi guys. Uh, to my wife, Beth. We have three kids, Peyton, Kate, and Jolie. Uh, ages 14, 12, and 11. So I've been involved in, in youth sports such as Little League and also YMCA. I've got involved with PCA because they preach the same message that I preach. Uh, I've been to a couple uh, clinics or, or presentations through our school district. Uh, I've met some PCA guys. And the first one I attended, I was just fascinated saying, hey, somebody's picking my brain because this is the way I'm thinking. What a great deal. I wanted to learn more about it. So now I'm here presenting. And, and I'd like to share my message with you. Um, you just finished the, the M tree uh, principle, which was effort learning and mistakes are okay. Now we're going to go into the filling the uh, principle number two, filling the emotional tank. I want you to picture something, guys. You're driving down the road, and all of a sudden your gas light comes on your vehicle. Um, what do you start thinking? Man, you're calculating how many miles to the gas station. Uh, am I going to make it? Uh, where's the closest gas station? How far can I push it till I have to stop? Uh, am I going to be late for the next meeting? You know, these feelings of an empty tank kind of make you nervous, upset, a little mad, worried. Hey, am I going to get stuck on the road? Um, but finally, you make it to the gas station. When you fill your gas tank up, how do you feel? Kind of calm, relaxed a little bit. You might go in and grab you a snack, continue on your way. So that's what we're going to talk about, filling our tank. Uh, as we go through our slides, the principle filling the emotional tank, uh, I've got some questions I'd like to ask you. What are some examples of athletes with a empty tank? How do athletes feel? Kelly, how, do, how does an athlete feel with an empty tank? Um, pretty lethargic and, and just not, not interested. Just, just really, just not, you know, not motivated. Just, just kind of bummed out. Right, right. How about you, Pat? Do you have a different example? Hang on, <laughs> muted there. Um, no, yeah, emotion. I think kids, kids that have a drained emotional tank, they're just, uh, they're not all there. You're not going to get the best performance out of them, and they're not going to have the best experience. Exactly. Exactly. Um, sometimes they're pessimistic, they, they might give up easily, they're less coachable, okay? Sometimes you can just tell in their physical appearance, or they're standing with their shoulders slumped, you know, or there's a head hanging down. Um, so we as coaches have to fill this tank. So what I'd like to do now is, is reverse tables and ask you, what does an athlete look like with a full tank? Okay, uh, Kelly, what would an athlete look like with a full tank? I always picture it like a puppy dog, just just so excited, you know, running to run into the field, just can't wait, coach. What's next? What's next? Just you know, up for anything, I'm ready to go. Exactly, exactly. Would you say that an athlete with a full tank would want to come to practice instead of have to come to practice? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Pat, give me one more example of of a athlete with a full tank. I've always noticed the athletes with full tanks are much more resilient. They you, they can get more out of practice because they're they're more willing to uh, take a hit every now and then and try new things, fail, try fail, and maybe support the teammates better too. Exactly. Very good. Uh, and I agree. I know in, in softball when my athletes have full tanks, if I hit a ball that's right at the fence or something, and we're doing drills, they'll they'll run through that fence if they have to to catch the ball when their tank is full. And on the other end, if their tank is drained, then I hit the same ball, they're liable to let it fall and walk and get it. So we as coaches have to fill their tanks, okay? What I want to do is I want to, I want to give you a, a little activity here. Kelly, you're going to be the batter, 
And Pat, you're going to be the tosser. And we're doing a little batting practice here. Okay? What we're going to do is, Kelly, you're going to swing and hit the first ball that Pat throws to you. Okay? Or you're going to attempt to hit the ball, but you're going to hit it. And Pat, what you, I want you to do is I want you to give Kelly some tank fillers. Okay? When she hits this ball. So whenever you're ready, Pat, you toss the ball and Kelly, you hit it. And then let me hear you, Pat. Oh, fantastic. Great swing. Good hit. Well done. Very good. Kelly, how are you feeling right now? I feel great. Like you could get up and hit it every time, huh? Sure, absolutely. I'm, I'm ready to go back and, and try again. Exactly. Um, tell me tell me some examples that Pat used. What were some good tank fillers? I think just his Brandon, smile. Brandon, did you hear any? Up. Thumbs up. Brandon, did you hear any? <laughs> Not sure if he's paying attention, but very good. I, I agree. Well, I, I agree. agree. That was a good one. <laughs> now, what we're going to do now is we're going to reverse roles. Pat, you're going to be the batter, and Kelly's going to be the tosser. But, Pat, you're going to swing and miss. And you're going to swing and miss, and you're going to swing and miss three times. Kelly, I want you to drain his tank every time. Mm -hmm. Hey, give him some tank drainers. All right, whenever you're ready. One, two, three, go. Oh, come on. Keep your eye on the ball. What, what did we just do in practice yesterday? Come on, swing through it. Swing through it. Oh, I was terrible. You struck out. Get on the bench. <laughs> hey, good job, you two. That's very good. Pat, how do you feel right now? Pretty great. Yeah, that was, uh, I don't know if I want to get up and bat again. <laughs> yeah, you, your confidence has is, is dropped tremendously. Um, tell, me, tell me the worst comment that you heard. Uh, I, for me, it's the, the uh, oh, come on, kind of comment. Right. Kelly, what, what was a negative uh, e emotion that you showed? I don't even know if you know you've, you've done it, but what was one visual that he could have saw you done? I did this. Exactly, exactly. So a lot of times tank drainers might not even be words. It could be body posture. It can be hands overhead, just dropping. And, and we, we drain tanks without even knowing sometimes we're draining them. So as our job as coaches, we got to fill these tanks back up. A lot of times coaches have a hard time uh, understanding tank fillers versus tank drainers. It takes time, and you have to be positive. Everything you do, you have to be positive. So one of the things that uh, I'd like to do is, is um, go over some, some tank fillers. You know, if you're truthful and, and specific praise, that always helps as opposed to draining the tank. So I try to be truthful with my athletes. If you're not getting the playing time you want, I'm going to truthfully tell you what you need to do to get better it would be in a tank filling mode where I say, look, I like the way you do this, this, and this, but we really need to work on this part of your game so you can jump into the lineup. If you keep working, you're going to get there. So I've given specific examples of what they need to do to get better. So it's not really draining their tank, it's helping them to achieve to get onto the field. One of the things that, that uh, another thing is expressing appreciation. You know, tell a kid when they do something good. If they uh, feel good about themselves, then they're going to they're gonna perform. So if a kid does something good, you need to praise that kid. Express appreciation. And one of the big myths is saying good job. Good job to me is generic. I mean, everybody does a good job. How about great job and being specific? Great job at fielding that ball and making the throw to first. Hey, that throw was not online, but you made a great throw, and we got her out because the first baseman scooped it up. Hey, how about a high five on that? And run up and, and express some appreciation, and the kids will know, hey, I, I might have to work on my throw, but you know what? I'm feeling pretty good because Coach said that was there. Um, at the end of each practice, what we do is we have a tank filling session. It's where we call everybody out, and, and everybody comes together, and what we do is go over and practice – what the day was like. 
and I pick out certain people in practice and say, hey, Sam, I like the way you threw the ball from home to first. That was a great job today. You kind of been struggling on that, but today you really performed. Now my other catchers are going to see that Sam's doing it right. They're going to jump on board. Um, I might have a kid that might not be as skilled in a position as other kids, but they are communicating. Hey, that is a great job of picking your teammate up. I like the way you're expressing words to help your teammate out. Everybody on this team is a family, and it takes the whole family to make this thing go. Now, um, one of the, the um, I'm lost here, magic ratio, excuse me. That leads us to the magic ratio. Five positives to one criticism. Five to one is a magic ratio. Research has been done uh, to prove that in relationships, athletics, and in life, if you have a five to one ratio, you're going to be more successful in everything you do. And I'm going to tell you a little story about practice yesterday. Um, I did some emotional tank draining. Today, after reflecting, I've got to go back and fill it up. Yesterday in practice, yesterday morning, uh, the school entrance was closed. We had a shooting sometime during the night. Police are all over the place, so we've got to go a different route. Um, so the outside activities were put on hold. So we didn't know a whole lot about it. But we're very close to the apartments where it happened. Uh, we were on camp. Uh, the, the guy that had the shooter got pulled over by police on campus, and there was a tragedy that happened. Uh, gunshots were fired, and the, and the shooter died. Well, about 2.30 before we come to practice, I find out that the shooter was a former Lamar student that played football for me. Mm. He just kind of flipped and, and lost his cool and, and don't know what happened. Well, when the police pulled him over, the policeman heard gunshots. He fired also. The policeman that fired was also a football player that played for me. They were good friends, graduated in the same class. So I was given this information 20 minutes before we go on to the field. How did I take that and go on to the field? When I got on the field, we went into practice, and I was not at my best game. I was trying to suppress everything I was feeling, which turned negative, which led me to draining tanks. Okay? Kids couldn't run bases right. We couldn't field right. Coaches wasn't directing right. At the end of the day, we had a coaches meeting, and, and we had a heated discussion. What is my vision? What I, my vision was not getting across like I thought it should be. Everybody left. Last night, I got on the computer. I watched the emotional tank hang out, spending about an hour by myself reflecting. I need to do a better job as a coach to fill tanks so my team can do a better job to perform. I came back this morning, typed up practice plan, went and met my coaches. We got a new motto. It's TWC, together we can. To make them better, I got to be better. It starts with me. So my number one job today is to go back and fill tanks. We're going to start our practice with a fun activity after I apologize to the girls for draining their tanks. Hmm. Because truthful and straight up is, is the best way to, that I know how to handle it. I will be truthful with the girls. They know that I will, in the end, care for them do whatever I can for them, but coach had a bad day too. So my tank was drained. I got it refilled. Now I'm ready to share that and fill some more tanks today. Our practice plan today, number one responsibility is going to be to fill tanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, nice job. You even had a minute to spare there, Pat. Nice job. Well done. How did you feel? Thank you. You know, Kelly, since I watched the hangout last night, I I've, I've woke up feeling great. I mean, the dog barked at 5, five o'clock to go out, and that's a little before I wanted to get up, but I didn't mind. I mean, it, it's just amazing how what, what you know, little things that, that fills your tank and gets you back on the, the right road. The day before, I was on cloud nine. Yesterday, I fell off. Today, I'm back on cloud nine. So I know as kids... Uh, you know, there was a kid this morning came in and I said, hey, you missed school yesterday. Where were you? Coach, I met my real dad for the first time. Yeah. I mean, wow. What, you know, this is how we start the morning. I'm thinking she's sick, hurt. Hey, 
met my real dad. Well, how was that? So we filled her tank up pretty good because her tank was full and, and kind of in between because she didn't know how to handle that. Yeah. But we gave her some love, gave her some care. And so I'm back on cloud nine, Kelly. Good. I'm so glad. What I'd like to do is have everybody go down the line and if you could just tell us um, one positive, one thing that you really liked about what Patrick did. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say one wish. What's something that you would uh, would like to see him do a little bit better? What's something you uh, you think you could help him with? So, Brandon, would you mind starting and just telling us one thing you really liked about Pat's presentation there? Yeah. One, one thing that I picked up on that was actually rather small. I'm not even sure how many people picked up on it uh, because it's something that I'm trying to do a much better job of with, with a bunch of our partners right now, but referencing and referring to a lot of the resources we have outside of our workshops. A lot of people feel like OER is we come in, we do a workshop, we say see you next year, we, and we don't always do a very good job of activating. Those are the areas outside of our, of our workshops that really help to keep the momentum going until we come back around that next year or until that next workshop. Uh, but, but you're referencing uh, towards the end of the conversation there, uh, going online and looking at the Hangout. Uh, you can even take that a step further and even uh, provide to people, you know, what exactly is this hangout that you're talking about? Where can they find it? Uh, but just the fact that you brought that up, to me, that was something small that I really liked. Mm -hmm. Or even for coaches, you could say, you know, hopping on the website and checking out some of the resources, the development zone resources, things like that. That's a good point, Brandon. Thank you. Yeah. Patrick Mason, Manson, what do you think? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I pick out two things I really liked. I liked, um, your introduction too. I, I was sitting there thinking, I would like to listen to this coach talk because he's got credibility. Your your experiences were strong, and uh, I like the way you introduced yourself. And uh, I love Texas accent anyway. So <laughs> good job. <laughs> and then the second one was, um, um, what was the second one? Oh, your story at the end. It was very personal. You really uh, shared some emotion on that, and it it was captivating. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely, Ruben. Yeah, I liked a lot. I liked a lot. Um, uh, if I were to pick one thing, it would be uh, Pat's use of the interactive activity mm -hmm. and his courage and willingness to do it online. Uh, you know, you know, I, 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 I really like the fact that you brought that into your your 14 minute piece of the workshop. Mm -hmm. And I think I had a lot of positives that I saw. If I had to just keep it down to to two, I think you're you're very easy to listen to. Your, your voice is very pleasant to hear, and I loved, again, that, that story at the end, I think that's a story that you could share at every single workshop that you do, and I think it's so cool that it just happened yesterday, but not only was it personal, it was relevant, and I also love it when trainers admit that we're not perfect, and that we make mistakes, and you learn from it, and I think that was a really, really unfortunate situation, but very powerful story that I won't forget. I think that was that was pretty incredible. Uh, and uh, to be honest, when, when I... When I sat down yesterday, I found out I was doing the e tank. I'm thinking, what am I going <laughs> to? Okay, where do I start? What to do? And it's kind of funny how everything unfolded mm -hmm. right in front of me. I mean, but it didn't take until sitting down by myself by 11 o'clock at night, a little quiet time, and listening to the hangout just to reflect and, and gather. And I mean, it was there. It was like, a pot of gold. Hey, this is what I need to do. Mm -hmm. And and it's kind of the same feeling I got the first time I, I listened to a PCA presentation. I mean, it's like, hey, I'm living it. I am living it. That's that's what I need to share. Mm -hmm. So that, that was fascinating to me that it just came to me. That's great. How about, me, how about a wish? Some... Um, Brandon, do you want to share something? Uh, yeah. Um, one, one thing I was taking a look at, a lot of times, so whenever I go around to board meetings, I always present on the E-Tank. Uh, I think Ruben's seen me do some stuff with the E-Tank before. It's, to me, the one that I think resonates with me the most. And um, I think it's important to point out to coaches that, you know, tank draining is not something that we are necessarily saying we absolutely cannot do. Uh, I think it's more so about, a, about when it is that we're doing it when it comes to tank draining. Uh, do the kids have an empty an empty tank or a full tank? Um, and the reason I say that is, is that it's not the end all be all to be a tank drainer is because coaching and criticism naturally is a tank drainer. Um, and so I think making a point about that and mentioning that that hey you you see that coaching and criticism is on the tank draining side, 
uh, that, that doesn't mean that we're not allowed to drain tanks. Just mm -hmm. need to be aware of when it is that we're doing it. Uh, but making some right, sort of positive sort of way. Right. Yeah. Okay, and I just to add to that, I think I, I mean I think it's great to say that criticism does not always have to be a tank drainer. But I, I would disagree that you don't want to tell somebody it's okay to drain tanks. I think it's okay to criticize, but I don't necessarily think it's okay to drain tanks. So maybe if you phrase it that way. Um, right. Just positive criticism. Yeah. I mean, just as so long as you make it positive, you're correcting them. You know, you're criticizing them, but in a positive instead of, hey, you silly, you know, whatever, 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 and, <laughs> and lead more negatives tank draining into it. Yeah. Got you. Thank Patrick you. Manson, do you have a, a wish? <laughs> Yeah, I would. Uh, it was either Kelly, you, or Ruben that shared the, the like if the five to one ratio. If you have to do 125 positives, if you have to give them 25 corrections, like how do you do that? And um, I thought that was really powerful. Server, you guys shared that. And, um, and and so yeah, on the emotional take, I remember locking that saying that, that's something I'd like to hear because I, as a coach, I could hear saying, oh man, 125. You know, if I have to correct them 25 times, which I might. So the idea of using buddies and, and uh, team coaches and things like that to contribute to the 125 positive. Mm -hmm. but that's like okay. Good point. Very good point. How about you, Ruben? A wish is um, I, I liked Pat's introduction. As Pat Manson said, I thought the introduction, you, you packed a lot of information in two minutes that, that brought credibility to you. At the same time, who has more credibility with the coaches in general? Pat Peliquin or Phil Jackson and Summer Sanders and Dusty Baker? And so, so that's a question for you, Pat. Who has more credibility coming into the room? Uh, it depends on, on what we're talking about. Girls softball, I'd say Pat Peliquin over Phil Jackson. <laughs> Okay. All right. So hey, no, I'm I'm just messing with you, Ruben. Uh, you know, th those names are more out there than my name. But hey, I'm a rise to any challenge, man. So 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 maybe I'm so so when I finish my point, maybe it'll make sense. Um, you, you, I like how you did your introduction. You said so. I'm here to share my message with you. I I actually would prefer that you say so. I'm here to share PCA's message with you. Okay. Um, that, that would be, and at the same time, what's going to make it all, all the better is that you are indeed going to blend in your experience, right. that, that wonderful story. You are going to blend it in, um, but position the workshop as a message from, messaging from Positive Coaching Alliance as opposed to messaging from Pat Peliquin. That would gotcha. be my wish. Yeah. Hey, I appreciate it. Yep, that's a good point, good point. Um, my wish that I put down in the very beginning, I think you have to be really careful as a presenter. You had a lot of great questions for us to think about, and I think you have to be crystal clear whether those questions are going to be answered by the audience, or they're going to be rhetorical questions, or they're going to be questions that you answer. So the very beginning of the workshop, you started talking about um, what, does a, what does a player with a low emotional tank look like, or how do they feel, and you were answering it for us uh, right off the bat. Like, oh, we might look this way or we might look that way. And I think it was a little bit confusing whether did you want us to raise our hand and answer you or did you just give us the answer. So in the very beginning, you were giving us a lot of the answers to the questions you were asking. And I would have liked you to you know, pull in the audience a little bit more for those from the very go beginning. Go over their answers. So ask questions and wait and then give answers. Is that what yeah. you mean? Or, or have them turn okay. to a partner and describe a player that you've coached that had a very low emotional tank. You know, something like that to get more people involved. Um, and it, okay. you know, it, it was just something I noticed right away that you were giving us the answers to questions you were asking. Um, the other well, that thing, 15 minutes was just shooting at me there, Kelly. I was just think 15. I got to get it all in. I, I know, you know you. what? And in a workshop too, you're only going to have you know about 15 minutes for each principal. So time is a right. reality. Time is something that we have to all be aware of, but you don't want the audience to feel like you're trying to squeeze in, you know, an hour's worth of information right. in 15 minutes. They don't know what you're going to be talking about, so that's why we have to kind of not worry about the ticking clock. Maybe shorten one of our stories to fit it in that that time frame. Uh, the other thing, and this is something that I, I thought, as as I said, you had a lot of great positives. 
But one of the things that I kind of um, warn people of, you said a few times, you just have to be positive. You just have to be positive. You just have to be positive. And, and I think being called the Positive Coaching Alliance, that sort of gets a generic sort of definition to it. And I was waiting for you to tell me the why. Because the why of being positive when you're filling tanks is so that the players are more coachable. And they're able to learn. And they're able to accept criticism. So I, I was hearing a lot of you saying, okay, yeah, out there we just got to be positive. We just got to be positive, which is all great, but give me the why. That's what I would have wanted okay. to hear a little bit more of. But I thought I thought you did a fantastic job. Ruben, is there anything else you want to follow up with before we uh, wrap it up with Pat? You know, Kelly asked for our feedback in a one-to-one -one ratio, right? One, one, po uh, one positive, one wish. The, the positives far outweighed the, you know, the, 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 the fine-tuning tips we're giving you here, Pat. It was a, a very well done 14 minute piece of the workshop. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and I hope you guys can all hang on to watch uh, Patrick Manson too. I thought that was that was great, Patrick. Thank you very much for sharing that. Kelly, yeah. I am going to stay on for Patrick Manson. Um, I do have a call uh, right at the top of the hour, so yeah. if I have to leave during the debrief, uh, Patrick Manson, that's why. Um, but I'm I'm on until that that call comes in. Okay, maybe we'll let you debrief first. Okay, so I think um, Patrick Manson, you're going to be doing the Elm Tree, correct? That's correct. Okay, so whenever you are ready, would you like me to give you a two minute warning also? Or are you good? Uh, you can, yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, whenever you're ready. All right. Well, my name is Pat Manson, and I'll be your Positive Coaching Alliance presenter for tonight. Uh, as you can see, our presentation topic for tonight is the Double Goal Coach, Coaching for Winning and Life Lessons. Um, so my story, I, had a, I have a long history in sports. I was a competitive athlete for many years. I competed all through uh, elementary school, middle school, up into high school. In high school, it was soccer and track and field, where I was uh, all-state team captain where I thought maybe I'd go on and play in college, but uh, it was the pole vault in track and field where I really found my wings. Ended up setting a national record in high school, jumped 18 feet, and uh, graduated on a high note as valedictorian. So that all got me to Division One college. I was I had a similar fun college career in sports and academics. And then that led me into professional sports. And I had a, uh, a wonderful experience with a long, uh, cool career in sports. And it, I can't even tell you how neat that was. Um, in the mid-90s, for two years, I got to be the number one pole vaulter in the United States, and um, uh, my best was 19 feet and a quarter. And then, as, as often happens in sports, as you transition out of being a competitive athlete, people say, well, why don't you come coach at a seminar and teach here? And I, I started to rotate more into coaching. One of the coolest things about the professional career was my exposure to some really cool coaches. I got to uh, be around some of the best. I got to live at the Olympic Training Center a couple times. Study what they did there. I got to go to the French and the Russian and the German coaches to study what they did there. And um, my own coach in high school, I just went to my local high school down the street. Turned out my coach was a top USA coach and in college as well. So I, I had the chance to be around some really neat coaches. So I, I was trying to be the best athlete I could be. So when I rotated into being a coach, the, the uh, first thing I did was call one of my own coaches. I was like, Coach, Coach, you're, you know, you're one of the greats and you know everything. What should I be doing here? And the coach just laughed, and he said, oh, man, the first thing you want to know is if you want to be a great coach, you have to know that you don't know everything. You have to be ready to learn, have your mind be open, and be ready to absorb new topics. And, uh, and that's how I started my coaching career. And so for the last 15 years or so, I've been getting more into coaching, and I've tried to learn everything I can. And that's what brought me to PCA. The more I learned about PCA, Positive Coaching Alliance, the more I learned that, man, these people have got it because it's about performance and in youth sports more than anything else, getting kids to have a great experience and get a great life lesson. Uh, better athletes, better people. And so that leads me here tonight. So here we are sitting in a room right now, and we've got, uh, I, I look around the room, and I'm betting that many of you are here, maybe all of you are here with the same idea that you, you'd really like to walk away with some good ideas, and I think that's how it's going to go through. So I hope this is more of an interaction and less of a less of a talk. Um, I, you guys get to know a little about me. I'd like to learn more about you. So uh, let's do an exercise where have everybody stand up. You guys don't have to stand up here. <laughs> but if you've been coaching for more than five years, stay standing. 
If not, have a seat. And then I go through this exercise and say 10 years stay standing, 15 years, 20 years, and then we'd have a couple coaches presumably standing at 20, and I would say, fantastic, how about a hand for those 20-year coaches? How about a hand? And then say, has anyone here been coaching 30 years or more? Please stay standing. Wow, how about a hand? <laughs> okay, everyone can go ahead and have a seat, please. Coaches, great job. And uh, for you veteran coaches out there that were standing at the end, I, I hope we have a chance to come talk to you later on, because I bet you've experienced probably everything there is to experience. Well, um, I told you a little bit about my story and some of these neat coaches I got to be around, but you know what one of the most important coaches in my career was? Was my first real coach, Coach K. I can remember Coach K like it was yesterday. In fact, I still go back and visit Coach K. And uh, his influence on me was beyond words. So um, you as coaches have a chance to have some great influences. Flipping over here to the next slide. See Steve Young here talking about that. Next slide. Who was the most influential coach in your life? I told you about my coach, Kay. Um, amazing man, amazing coach. Really set my course in life. When I go back and visit him, I say, Coach, I need to thank you because you changed the course of my life. The, the brief time we inter you know, we overlapped. You were my coach for a couple years when I was a kid. You changed the course of my life. You set me up for business, for life or who I was going to marry someday, you had a huge influence. So coaches, for you in this room right now, how do you want to be remembered? That's a key question. How do you want to be remembered? So can we take a minute here? I look around the room. I see we could break up into groups of about four or five people. Can you sit down and each one of you share a story about the most influential coach of your life? And take about a minute each. We'll take five minutes total here, and then uh, we'll call us back together as a group and uh, hear some of those stories. And we take a break and come back. Do any of you here on this conference call want to share a story of a great coach or influential coach in your life in less than a minute? Sure, I will. Uh, probably my high school coach. Um, he, he coached high school, junior high, and sixth grade. So he was kind of my sixth grade through high school all the way. Uh, I started playing high school ball in seventh grade. It was a smaller school, so seventh and eighth graders were allowed. So I had seven fantastic years with the same coach. Um, really positive influence on me and, and one of the reasons uh, why I'm in coaching today. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else have a great story? And you, know, that's, uh, uh, and you hear that over and over again, you know, when you hear from coaches. Uh, that they, that, or even adults who aren't even in sports anymore. When they think back on the youth, they can remember those first coaches. Well, you can see oh, on the map here that. Oh. I was going to mention something real quick. It's a, it's a complete side note. It's not necessarily my coach, but if you'll take a look at the link that um, I just posted in the, the little chat area. Um, this was a note that, re, that we received very recently. I got, I got it on Monday um, of a uh, kid in high school now who's had his coach, Pat, like you said, since he was in sixth grade. And, one of the kid and the kid just explains to him in his note about how much he respects his coach and how much he looks up to him and uh, thank you so much for everything he's done for him in his life and so for me I just find that so cool seeing a kid at that age level recognizing that you don't necessarily always see that with the kids how they recognize those coaches when they're that age yeah and that's the truth too those young kids and uh, I think it's, uh, as coaches too we all know that even when the kids don't recognize that and don't give us that feedback. Some kids are quiet and shy. They don't say that. So we do have this big influence. We have a unique opportunity. And PCA is recognized. As you can see on the next map, that PCA here on this map of the U.S. rapidly expanding. It's all around the country now, and it's, it's grown more than it even shows on this map. There's a lot of great supporters that support this idea of helping kids learn these great lessons. Better athletes, better people. This next slide, you can see some of the uh, some of the high-level coaches and athletes that support PCA because PCA is not it's not a, it's not just a feel good thing to make kids feel good about sports. It's to have better performances in sports as well as learn the life lessons. You can see on this slide there's Summer Sanders, there's Doc Draper, Julie Fowdy, Bill Jackson, uh, and the list goes on. The, the number of athletes, and this is just a partial list, there's, there's hundreds of athletes that are big supporters of PTA and the message that it's, it's getting out there. Because youth sports is such a unique short time in, a, in children's lives or kids' lives. 
and um, so many possible learning moments there, and they're often not taken advantage of. But in the bottom corner, you'll see there's a, a youth athlete, a youth coach, and that's and that's what PTA is really about: is youth coaching team. And uh, that's where you come in as coaches. If you you have that chance. PTA's model of coaching is you see these two circles where they overlap. They're striving to win and teaching life lessons. And they overlap, and that's then that's how sports should be and can be. And I know for many of you it is. PTA systems approach. You can see there's there's uh, four corners on this slide. It's the, the leadership, the parents, the coaches, and the triple impact competitors. And, you, and the glue that holds all this together, the interaction between all of those, is it's you, the coaches. You interact with the leaders of your sports associated. You interact with the parents. You interact with the kids. Now that said, you're not the center of the chart. <laughs> the reason we all do this is for the kids. We do it for the youth athletes. And our mission, the mission of everybody on that page, is to help the youth athletes grow and become better people and better athletes. So what are the principles that, that we'll be talking about today? We have the elm tree of mastery, filling the emotional tank, and honoring the game. And what these three things really mean is the elm tree is all about the athlete's performance, how can athletes perform better. The e tank is about their mental state, their frame of mind, because we all know that sports psychology is a big piece, and as well as just the emotional health of the kids. And then the honoring the game piece, we use the acronym ROOT, the positive coaching line, and that's about the bigger picture. Sports is not, it's not all about sports. It's a piece of a, a healthy life and a, a healthy lifestyle. All right, you can see from this slide, which athletes earn the most medals? Those who focus on the scoreboard or those who focus on mastering the sport? Well, in the year 2000, Joan Duda at the Sydney Olympic Games, let me flip to this next slide real quickly. That's me standing on the infield at the city Olympics. I was there. <laughs> that was one of the games I was an alternate for. And so uh, you can see the, uh, the infield there in the stadium. That was really neat. And I actually remember hearing about this study that Joan Duda did shortly after these games. And one of the neat things about uh, being down here is that one of my teammates won the gold medal at that game. It was the first U.S. gold football team. I've gotten off track a little later. But, but it, was the, it was on this concept right here on that the, those who focus on mastering their sport and get better do better performances. Because what my friend told me who got the gold is that, her name is Nick Hightong, is that the pressure is unimaginable when you're out there with the chance to win a gold medal right here in your hand. And that if you can relax and just focus on the execution of the skill, everything goes better. And so this study from 2000, that's what, that's what the end, end point is, that the mastery focus is better than the scoreboard. Now you see this video here by Matthew McConaughey about what we are marking. And then Kelly, like we talked about, I'll, I'll keep working on a way to work that in in a good way. All right, so principle number one is the Elm Tree of Mastery. The Elm Tree of Mastery, E-L-M, is the acronym, and it stands for Effort, Learning, and Mistakes Are Okay, E-L-M. And we call it the elm tree, and it's easier to remember the, the concept of a tree, right? But the elm tree. Well, those are those are three concepts that'll help your athletes perform better. And let's look at let's look at effort first. Effort's the first one. So athletes will do what they're rewarded for, right? So if you if you come up with ways as a coach to reward your athletes for their efforts, um, you'll end up getting those better performances. That'll be a couple ways you can do that. You can set up some stretch goals where they're going to have to take some effort to go get them. Another one would be to set up effort, effort goals where you say, listen, we're going to set up goals where your goal is to make a better effort, whether that would be to chase after 10 soccer balls in your soccer play or some other example. And we can break into small groups here shortly and we'll talk more about what some of those could be. And then another one is to reward unsuccessful efforts. And I can tell you that for me as a pole vault coach, I coach pole vaulting, and the kids come out and they get they get into a routine where they do the same technique and they run down the runway, they jump the same exact way. And so part of teaching the pole vault is to have them break out of that habit and undo what they've been doing. So 
when they run down there to vault, I'll say, all right, try and straighten your top arm when you vault. And they'll go down there and their body will shake funny while they jump. And, and we all go crazy. We get everyone to go, yeah, great, you did something. You did something. You made an effort. And it showed. That's like step one of 20 steps now. You did something. Your nervous system reacted. Now, the next time, see if you can get that arm a little bit straighter at the right time. And we'll work through a progression like that. And that's, that's how we record effort in art. But, you know, do something. Don't just run down and do the same thing in a, in a technical event of mine. That really makes it. All right, the, uh, and that, that was F, the E of Elm Tree. The second is learning, having a learning focus. And again, what's your athlete see you rewarding and focusing and talking about is what they're going to pay more attention to learning. So, so the learning, the learning focus is really important to coach. You want to make sure your athletes are always learning and that you emphasize that they learn more about the rules of the game and the technique. Um, you can have them come home after a weekend and say, did you watch some pro sports over the weekend? What did you learn? Give me an example. Learning is really important. That's the L of the Elm Tree. And then the, the, uh, the M stands for mistakes, and that's having the mistakes are okay. And again, looking back at that study from the Olympics about performance, when that's tense and under pressure, they don't end up performing well. So, so um, one way that athletes get tense is when they hear mistakes. And uh, the example you often hear is if, if the athlete gets the ball in front of the net, and they turn around and they take the shot, and they miss, and everyone's like, oh, man, you missed the shot. You shouldn't have missed the shot. What do you think can happen next time they have a chance to take that shot in front of the net? They can be relaxed and ready to take the shot. I don't tentative. So, they'll be tentative. Yeah, that's right. They'll, they'll be tentative. And then, and then you need your players. You need your players out there going for going for that little bit of extra. So, so, um, so mistake, having a mistake is really important. One way you can coach your athletes on that is to have a mistake ritual where they work on, they have a physical sign for mental reset. And that is like brushing off or they can straighten their shirt out or they can flush. And, and you as coaches can work with your athletes on that. And like everything else, just like a skill, you need to practice these in practice as well. And that's how your athletes can, can pick up on all of these things in the LM setup. So effort, learning, and the mistakes are okay are the elm tree of math. All right. Ooh. That time doesn't go by fast. <laughs> it does go very fast. And and part of that too, part of the elm tree too, would be to go into the um, like the feeling of control, and then the scenario is all part of that too. So that would be you know additional time. But you did you did the intro as well, which you know you did the intro and elm tree. So I think your timing was was fine with that. Um, Ruben, I know you have to go. Did you want to give your feedback first? Yes. Thanks for that opportunity, Kelly. Um, so. Uh, let me let me see. Um, first of all, hey Pat and Patrick, I want to invite you to give me a phone call, um, and I can give you a little more detail feedback um, if if you'd like to hear it. Um, my phone number. Here's my phone number. It's five five nine three six zero one six six seven. For the next hour, I'll be in an appointment. Um, call me anytime after that, today, next week, six months from now. I'll, I'll, I've got a couple more notes if you want to hear them. Uh, but so, so, Patrick, what do I want to share with you? Uh, again, many strengths. Boy, I'll tell you, um, if I had to highlight one, it would be uh, uh, the Joan Duda Olympic athlete slide and how you weaved in the personal experience, your friend that won a gold medal. Shortly after the Olympics, I actually read about this. I mean, you just brought so much credibility to that important, important piece. Uh, just uh, very well done. Um, by the way, you, you presented for 15 minutes. You spent 11 minutes on what I would call the workshop opening, and you spent four minutes on, what I, on, on Elm. Uh, so you you move through a lot in 15 minutes, a lot. Um, uh, okay, so with my with my couple minutes here, Kelly, I want to ask Patrick three questions. So so Patrick, the role that you, Kelly is taking you through and coaching you on, and that you are preparing for, the title of the position is what? PCA trainer. 
Yes. So when you mention at the start of the workshop that I will be the PCA presenter, yep. I'm your PCA trainer. Okay. And and a trainer, the train a trainer um, means certain things. Presenter implies what? What yeah. does it present? You yeah, know where I'm going. Information. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, I encourage you to use the word trainer. And if you don't want to use trainer, trainer over and over again, that my second choice would be facilitator. Um, because right. it, 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 it's you know what I mean. Okay. Second question. When I ask folks, when I want participation, and I invite folks in to participate, and I say. Does anyone want to share a great story? What does that do? As opposed to anybody want to tell us about the coach that had the most impact on them? What what oh, am yeah. I? Do you know where I'm getting going with this, Patrick? Take well, a stab it, at it. it. It's, uh, when you say, does anyone want to share a great story? Is that? Uh, I don't know if my story is great. I don't know if it's great. Well, wait a minute. If that's he's just fine. asking me to tell about a coach that had a great impact on me, that's one thing. Anybody have anybody else have a great story? Shoot, I don't know if my story is great. I think you're yeah. going to have people hesitate <laughs> if you couch it that way. And Patrick, you can see I'm uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm nitpicking here, aren't I? I'm, I'm making okay. And so my third question is, what is the uh, advantage of having people pair up to discuss something as opposed to putting them in a group of four or five to discuss something? Yeah, certainly pair up. Everyone's going to get to talk. I mean, you have to you know, pair. <laughs> so, so I would encourage you most of the time when you're going to have them talk to each other, most of the time, I'd have, I'd encourage you to put them in pairs. Not every time, you know, there, there's, there, but, but, and, and, and the first time, the first time, I would definitely put them in pairs so that everybody says something. So those are my questions for you, uh, Patrick. I very much enjoyed uh, both both workshop pieces, and I'll I'll continue to listen in until my next call comes in. I'm done. Thanks. Thanks, mm -hmm. Ruben. Thanks, Ruben. All right, um, Brandon. Do you want to give Patrick a, your feedback, positive feedback? Yeah, well, one of the things I also wrote down as well, Patrick, is the same credibility from the from uh, John Duda study. I thought that was a, I mean, a really really cool take on it. It was not one that I can I can think of too many of our trainers that can weave it in quite like that. Uh, but one one of the other ones that, that I really liked was at the very very beginning, how when you're just doing the quick little exercise of, of trying to find out how long people had been coaches for, um, and at the very end you you invited those more experienced coaches. Hey. It would be great to talk to you afterwards and hear some thoughts from your from your expertise. Because um, you know, in my experiences from my role, my side of things as the partnership manager, I do all of our outreach, such as our, our sales side of things, and then all of our account management as well. So following up with everybody. And what I found is that with, with the schools that we work with, we don't necessarily ever struggle with coaches willing to learn because that's their profession. Um, unfortunately, though, for the youth sports organizations that we work with, I hear quite often that you know our coaches have been around for 10 years, been the same coaches for 15 years, 20 years. They know it all. I hear that comment all the time to some sort of extent. And, it, and to me, is, is a lot of these being the volunteer coaches, that this is not their profession, it bothers me a little bit. So inviting those, volunteer, those, uh, those, those more experienced coaches, whether they're school coaches or youth sports organization coaches, I think is a, is a really inviting way to go ahead and open up their ears a little bit more by showing that, hey, you're welcome, you're accepted. Uh, I do think there's something that you're going to learn from us, but also we can learn something from you at the same time. Good. Good feedback. That's true. Um, Patrick Heliquin, what's, uh, what are some positives for Pat? Well, dang, Brandon stole my number one. Hey, Patrick, <laughs> I like the way you did that exercise, but what made me feel good, if I'm listening to the presentation, is you gave respect to the elder coaches, and you made it a point to say, hey, I want to visit with you guys when this is over so I can learn something. Mm -hmm. In today's world, I feel like a lot of coaches getting into the business, and I'm talking about between one and ten years, come in thinking, you know what, I know it all. I don't learn. Uh, somewhere in society, I, I think we are, are disrespecting elders to some extent due to Google search, uh, you know, computer technology, and that that 
that appreciation of guys that were, hey, like me, 24 and plus, man, I like you. Hey, that, you did good there. I like that. Thanks. Yeah, very good. Um, I, I agree with everything everyone said, and I had them all as positives. One of the things I really like about the way you present, Patrick, is that you have really good terminology for things. You have a, a phrase or something that I, I write down because I'm like, that's like just even as simple as saying like the, the coaches are the glue that holds it all together. I mean, I think that's a great way. I love that when you said you're the glue that interacts with everyone, but you're not the center of that chart. I've never brought that up before. I thought that was really, really an incredible way to, to present that slide. I thought that was excellent. Um, also, you know, just bringing up things like athletes will do what they're rewarded for and, and that you need to practice this. And that's when Ruben mentioned about we're PCA trainers. That's something that I always bring up as kind of a side joke. You know, I tell people what I do, and I say, oh, I'm a trainer for PCA. And they're like, great, because I really have to work on my abs. It's like the first thing they always say to me. And, and I laugh, and I say, oh, well, I'm not that type of a trainer. But it is the same role. You're, you're slowly helping people practice to make themselves better, physically, mentally, whatever. So um, I just think you, your phrasing is very good. Um, your pace is great. And, and your, story, your storytelling was excellent, very relevant, bringing it right back to – you know, from the Steve Young video and Coach Gay that you were talking about to the Olympic story. I mean, it was all very relevant and timely. I thought it was very good. Thanks. All right. Uh, Brandon, is there anything that you would have a wish for Pat? Yeah. Um, I wrote this down for, for both of you, actually. Um, for um, I'm sure you all have seen the books by now, and the books is an extra investment from partners that we work with. And uh, So for especially the larger workshops, those costs for the books can really add up. And so trying to add in more value within the workshop of what that book is and what that resource is, I think it's great after the workshop follow-up, but also within the workshop um, on the slides, it will have the page number on there, but also reference it throughout the time that you're, that you're speaking and uh, leading the conversation with everybody and, and say, hey, you know what, uh, up there on the slide, page 32, let's take a minute and read this page and we'll come back afterwards. But just go ahead and get them to dive into the book during the workshop. That's a really good point to bring up, and I love it. That's why people like you are on these calls because it's not that's at the forefront of your mind. And I think you know, Patrick, when you you hit a lot of tools right off the bat when you did effort goals, you nailed like three or four tools: effort goals, stretch goals, rewarding unsuccessful effort. Perfect time to say, you know what? Open up to page thirty-two. I'm going to mention a couple that I really like. You know, that's a great way to slide it in. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Uh, Pelican. Uh, yeah, uh, Patrick, I I liked your intro. I think. If you dissect it a little more, because I, I kind of got lost in there where where you were uh, at this time, this time, and this time. So I think if maybe you dissect it a little more, I think you've got a lot of information there. But really bring out the the the, the great things that you've done. Um, you know, I did catch okay, I, I did this in middle school and this and this. And then by the time you got to professional, I was almost like rather hear the professional first and then go because that really. You know, I kept waiting for that 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 sinker, that 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 punchline, so to speak, and and it finally came. But I think you need to, man, because you've got a lot there. Bring out that good stuff right at the start, man, so they get their attention. Boom, wham. All right, hey, this guy, wow. So I think if you dissect it, just kind of change it up a little bit and come with the whammy first, and then go into the other stuff. Because you, you had me waiting, but it was almost like. I know it's coming, I know it's coming, I know it's coming. Okay, there it is. Well, hit me with it first, and now you got me, and then you can kind of get your other stuff. That's the only thing I would do different. Everything else was, was good, man. And and I hope you're not as nervous as I was. <laughs> oh, I was. Uh, yeah. Hey, I, I did. Thank you for bringing that up, Pat, because I, I actually struggled with that because I, I thought, what is the mission of an introduction for a talk like this to coaches? Because there's always the, I don't care where you've been or who you are, that some coaches take. And then so, so there's a balance. Like what is the mission of an introduction? It's to build credibility with the people you're speaking to. So like, well, okay. Because like Pat, when you spoke, I was like, well, this guy knows what he's talking about. So I guess I'll, I'll listen a little more carefully. Mm -hmm. But it's also to begin to introduce some of the concepts. And that, that was the point of my story about my coach saying, you don't know everything, right? And so, yeah, I'd, I'd love to, if you have any more feedback. Like how do you share that, the, the athletic successes without sounding cocky or arrogant? But you, you still need them to build credibility. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Challenge. Just change it up a little. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. 
Um, my only suggestion is sort of what Ruben said too. Um, I think five minutes is way too long to ask people to talk, and they're going to lose their interest, even if it's five people. Because um, usually when I get to the e-tank, I do an activity where I do have them get into groups, according to you know probably four or five coaches, and I still only give them about three minutes. And I find if you give people two or three minutes to talk, it just creates a sense of urgency. For some reason, if you give them five minutes, they'll sit there and talk about, oh yeah, I saw you at the store yesterday, or how's your how's your wife, or how you know they get kind of off track. But if you give them a shorter amount of time, you're the one in charge of the clock. And I've given groups two minutes and then looked around and gone, they're not finished yet. So I'm going to give them a little bit more without telling them. But I think keeping it on the front of their mind that this is your task, you have a very short amount of time to do it, go, is is kind of a more effective way. And do you do that with two people, Kelly? Yeah, I do it with two people too. Usually, if it's two people, I only give them one minute to share. And again, you know, I, I say one minute. Usually, I stick to one minute. But you know, if it's something really a heated discussion, I would say, okay, put your hand on your head if you need more time or something like that. Because you can just tell by reading the group if they need some more time to talk about something. Right, right. But, yeah. but I did and like I the way that, that you hey, got. Go ahead. I'm I'm sorry. What I was going to tell Patrick, hey, I'd. Re I'm ready to go. Okay, in one minute we're leaving. That minute can be extended. So yeah. that's kind of what I would relate it to there, Patrick. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. And and the only other the only other um, critique that I had was that when you're going through the elm tree, as I said, that the scenario comes next, and then I think the a really important slide I think is the mastery approach gives you that feeling of control. And I didn't want I know you know I didn't cut you off for time yet, so you could have kept going. I think that is really a strong key to the elm tree, the idea of controlling what you can control. And that's where the performance increases because they're in control of what they can control. So I just wanted to make sure that you knew that that was really an important part of elm tree, that the athletes are going to work harder and stick to it longer. We know that. Why? Because they're in control. And and that's a that's a huge part. And that when you get into that and then you work into the scenario of Jesse hanging his head um, you know, every time he misses a shot, that's when the player, the coaches now can discuss why. What is Jesse in control over? How can we, as coaches, as you said, if they do what you're rewarded. The athletes do what they're rewarded for. What are you rewarding as a coach? So I just think that I just wanted to make sure you didn't make that drop off. And then the next slide that has the toolkit, that's maybe when you can go into more details about some of the tools, rather than saying like effort. Here's a bunch of tools. Learning. Here's a bunch of tools. Mistakes. Here's a bunch of tools. You know, just just a suggestion. All right, Ruben, did you have anything else for the good of the cause? All right, you're muted. Um, actually, one thing uh, I want to thank both Pat and Patrick, and I want to thank Brandon. Brandon, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to to join us. Very much appreciated. And Kelly, I got to congratulate you on uh, helping. Pat and Patrick uh, get to such an impressive point in their uh, trainer development. Congratulations, well, Kelly. They had a lot of great things to work with. But <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. All right, guys, I will get some follow-up. Patrick, I think you are strong and ready to go for Saturday. I think uh, good luck to you. It's going to be awesome. Thank you. Hey, I'm ready. Bring it on. And I'll talk to Cam afterwards on Saturday and, and get some feedback back from him, and hopefully he'll be able to you know, sit you down and – and kind of break things apart on Saturday right after the workshop. Hopefully you'll have a chance to do that. He's a great person to learn from. So that's, yeah, uh, that's great I'm that you're able to do that. Yep. And Patrick Manson, we will be in touch too to get you on to the next step. Thank you very much, guys. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. And if you guys have any desire to jump in on any of the other Hangouts, any of the presentations, just let me know, and I can send you the link. Because right now I'm just sending them out to the people that are presenting. But if you guys want, you have the schedule, so if you want to get in on any of the other ones just to be an audience member or just watch, you're welcome to do that too. Kelly? Thank you, Kelly. Yeah. Kelly, can you and I stay on for a few minutes since my call yeah. hasn't come in? Yep. Thanks. Up. Yep, yep, yep. All right, thanks, guys.